Quarantine Shadows The cold wind howled through the narrow alleyways of Boston as the first reports of an unknown virus surfaced. Panic spread faster than the infection itself, and soon the city found itself plunged into chaos. In a modest apartment on the outskirts of the city, Peter Mitchell huddled in fear, watching the world outside disintegrate through his grimy window. The news had been dire, but Peter never thought it would come to this. As the infected roamed the streets, the city plunged into madness. Sirens wailed, and distant screams echoed through the air. The once lively neighborhood now resembled a ghost town. Peter, a middle-aged man with a receding hairline and a thin frame, had become a prisoner in his own home. Fear gripped him, paralyzing any rational thought. The moans of the undead lingered like a sinister symphony outside his apartment door. The initial days of the outbreak had seen Peter glued to the television, absorbing every bit of information. But as the situation worsened, he barricaded himself inside, the heavy furniture forming a makeshift fortress against the impending doom, the fear of the unknown rendering him motionless, trapped within the confines of his paranoia. The water supply dwindled, and canned goods disappeared one by one. Peter rationed his food, unwilling to venture outside even for necessities. His once comfortable home transformed into a prison of isolation, haunted by the shadows of uncertainty. Late one night, as Peter strained to hear any signs of the undead outside, a faint knock echoed through the building. His heart pounded in his chest as he listened intently. Another knock followed, this time more persistent. Peter clenched his fists, sweat forming on his brow. Should he answer? What is it, a survivor seeking refuge, or a trap set by the infected? Days passed, and the knocking persisted. The isolation gnawed at his Peter's sanity. The loneliness and fear began to blur reality, and his once clear mind succumbed to the delirium of isolation. Sleep deprivation and paranoia created hallucinations of shadows lurking in the corners of his apartment, whispering dark secrets that fueled his terror. As the city outside descended further into chaos, Peter's mental state deteriorated. One day, driven by a desperate need for supplies, he mustered the courage to venture into the eerily silent streets. The cityscape was unrecognizable, buildings tainted by the aftermath of the outbreak. Peter moved cautiously, haunted by the memories of the once familiar streets now overrun by the undead. Boston, once a vibrant city, now stood as a graveyard of the living. Peter stumbled through the desolation, his eyes hollow and haunted. He scavenged for supplies, his every step echoing with the realization that the world as he knew it had crumbled. In the end, it wasn't the zombies that proved to be Peter's greatest enemy. It was a fear that kept him prisoner in his own mind. The infected roamed the streets, but Peter had been a captain long before the outbreak, shackled by the invisible chains of his own terror. Desperate Hours Detective Michael Reynolds sprinted through the chaotic streets of New York, his heart pounding in his chest. The first day of the outbreak had unleashed a nightmarish torrent of undead upon the city. Michael's only thought was to get home to his wife, Emily, and their two young children. As a veteran police officer, Michael had faced danger before, but nothing prepared him for the horrors that now roamed the once bustling streets. The initial calls came in his isolated incidents, but within hours, the city plunged into anarchy. Reports of cannibalistic attack flooded the police radio, and Michael knew he had to reach his family before it was too late. Abandoning his patrol car, Michael maneuvered through abandoned vehicles and panicked crowds. The city that never slept now lay paralyzed by fear. Smoke billowed in the distance, and the distant scream mingled with the sporadic gunfire that echoed through the concrete canyons. Michael's police radio crackled with updates from his colleagues, each report more dire than the last. The outbreak had spread like wildfire, overwhelming law enforcement and emergency services. The world outside had succumbed to chaos, but Michael clung to the hope of reuniting with his family. His mind raced as he navigated the once familiar streets, now transformed into a battlefield. He fought his way through pockets of the undead, using his police training to stay one step ahead. The stench of death hung in the air as he moved through desolate neighborhoods haunted by memories of the city he once served. As Michael neared his apartment building, his anxiety intensified. The journey would have taken him minutes, now it felt like an eternity. He burst through the entrance, 
his police badge glinting in the dim light of the lobby. Stairwell after stairwell he climbed, each step echoing the desperation of a father racing against time. Upon reaching his floor, Michael hesitated outside his apartment door. The ominous silence sent shivers down his spine. Slowly turning the key, he stepped into the dimly lit living room. His eyes scanned the place, searching for any sign of his family. A muffled sound caught his attention. Michael's heart leapt as he followed the noise to the bedroom. There he found Emily huddled with their children, fear etched on their faces. Relief flooded him, but it was short-lived. The windows rattled as the undead pounded on the building. Michael knew they had little time. With a determined resolve, he ushered his family out of the apartment. The once familiar streets now served as a perilous path of safety. In the heart of the outbreak, Michael Reynolds, a devoted father and police officer, faced the ultimate test of survival. Together with his family, they navigated the treacherous streets of New York, determined to find refuge in a world that had crumbled into chaos on the first day of the apocalypse. Eternal Shadows In the desolate world that had succumbed to the clutches of the undead, two brothers, Alex and Jake, found solace in the unlikeliest of professions, delivery men for the remaining human settlements. With their trusty old truck, they traversed the abandoned highways, delivering supplies and hope to the dwindling pockets of humanity. The brothers had learned to navigate the new world with a careful blend of survival instincts and cunning. They moved quietly, avoiding the undead hordes that roamed the streets. The once vibrant cities now stood as silent, crumbling reminders of the civilization that once thrived. One day, as the brothers approached the settlement on the outskirts, they noticed an eerie silence that hung heavy in the air. The settlement seemed deserted, its gates wide open. Unease gnawed at their guts as they cautiously entered, weapons at the ready. They soon discovered the settlement had fallen prey to a group of cannibals, led by a charismatic yet deranged individual named Marcus. Unlike the typical undead, Marcus and his followers believed that by consuming the flesh of the undead, they could become impervious to the virus, a twisted form of immortality. The brothers, having stumbled upon this gruesome scene, realized the immediate threat posed by Marcus and his cannibalistic horde. They decided to retreat silently, avoiding confrontation, and formulating a plan to warn neighboring settlements about the impending danger. As they traveled, delivering supplies and spreading the word, the brothers encountered more settlements that had fallen victim to Marcus's insidious group. The undead were coming less of a concern as the cannibals grew in number and ruthlessness. Determined to put an end to the cannibals' reign of terror, Alex and Jack began gathering allies from the remaining settlements. They formed a resistance force, armed with the knowledge of the cannibals' tactics and their hunger for the undead. The final showdown took place in an abandoned industrial complex, where Marcus had set up his twisted headquarters. The air was thick with tension as the resistance clashed with the cannibalistic horde. Amidst the chaos, Alex and Jake confronted Marcus, their brotherhood tested by the horrors they faced. In a fierce battle, the brothers managed to defeat Marcus, shattering the illusion of immortality that had driven his followers to madness. With Marcus gone, the remaining cannibals either dispersed or joined the surviving settlements, realizing the futility of their dark quest. As the brothers stood amongst the ruins of the industrial complex, they reflected on their sacrifices made and the losses endured. The undead may have brought chaos, but it was the darkness within humanity that had posed an even greater threat. In this new world, where survival meant more than just avoiding the undead, Alex and Jake continued their journey, committed to bringing hope to those clung to life amid the eternal shadows. The Hollow's Descent, A Symphony of Shadows The moon hung low in the inky sky, casting an eerie glow over the desolate town of Raven's Hollow. A thick fog crept through the deserted streets, shrouding the once lively community in an ominous silence. The air was heavy with the stench of decay, and the only sound that echoed was the distant moaning of the undead. It had started innocently enough. A mysterious virus had spread like wildfire, turning the unsuspecting residents into flesh-hungry monsters. The military had tried to contain the outbreak, but their efforts proved futile. Now, Raven's Hollow stood as a graveyard of the living, with only the restless dead roaming its forgotten streets. Amelia, 
a young woman with wild eyes and a heart pounding with fear, tiptoed through the abandoned buildings, her flashlight flickering as she navigated the darkness. She had lost everyone she loved to the relentless horde, and now survival was her only instinct. The crunching of gravel under her boots echoed in the eerie stillness. Suddenly, a low growl pierced the silence, freezing Amelia in her tracks. She aimed her flashlight toward the source of the sound, and gasped at the sight of a grotesque figure limping towards her, its milky eyes glow with hunger that sent shivers down her spine. The creature's rotted flesh hung from its bones, and its tattered clothing hinted at a past life now consumed by an insatiable desire for human flesh. Amelia's heart raced as she stumbled backwards, her breath hitching with every step. The creature closed in, and more emerged from the shadows, their haunting moans echoing from the fog. Panic set in, and she turned to run, her flashlight casting erratic beams of light as she desperately sought an escape. The once familiar streets now seemed like a labyrinth of death, each corner hiding a new horror as she sprinted through the maze of twisted alleys. The relentless pursuit of the undead never waned. The air was thick with the stench of decay, and the fog seemed to swallow her whole. Amelia's chest burned with exhaustion as she stumbled into an old, dilapidated church. The creaking door groaned as she forced it closed, hoping to buy a moment of respite. The darkness inside was oppressive, and the silence felt like a weight on her shoulders. Just as she caught her breath, a low, guttural growl emanated from the shadows. The pale, lifeless eyes of the undead emerged from the corners of the room. Panic seized her at once, and she fumbled for anything to defend herself. In the dim light, she spotted a rusted shovel leaning against the altar. As the first zombie lunged her, Amelia swung the shovel with all her strength, the metal connecting with a sickening thud. The others closed in, their grotesque forms illuminated by the feeble glow of her flashlight, the once sacred space now echo with the desperate sounds of survival. Amelia fought with everything she had, the echoes of her struggle bouncing off the church's walls. The undead seemed endless, a relentless tide that threatened to engulf her. In the midst of the chaos, she couldn't help but wonder if Raven's Hollow was doomed to be a graveyard for the living, or if, against all odds, she could cling to life and defy the nightmarish fate that had befallen her world. Hello from Beijing. I believe I'm patient zero of a future zombie outbreak. Hello, my English name is Amanda Liu, and I'm a master's student at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. As you may agree, China is flawed from a political standpoint. Most of the people in my generation know this. To be fair, I have friends in the Western world who feel the same way about their own leaders. As we have seen recently, viruses have no borders, and it is incredibly important that the world is aware of my condition. I resent having to use a VPN just to post on this. Government censors are preventing me from telling my story through any form of Chinese media. I write to you now in what is a rare state of lucidness. Before my death, I would like to make my story known. The source of my illness did not come from food or animal origin. Some strange food is consumed here, but the strangest of these foods, like bats and pangolins, are only consumed by a very small percentage of the population. You can compare it to the number of Americans who eat possum or armadillo. I personally like Subway and Pizza Hut, which is very popular here. As part of my master's project, I traveled to a remote part of Yunnan province in order to document one of the world's rarest known mushrooms. It is known here only by its traditional name, which roughly translates to black brain fungus. The mycelium, which act like the roots of the mushroom, has only been found growing in underground caves deeper than 200 meters. No one has ever documented the fruiting of this mushroom which is what happens when the mycelium produces its reproductive organs above ground. So you can imagine my joyous surprise when 300 meters underground, in total darkness pierced only by my head torch, I stumbled upon the potentially first ever discovered fruiting specimen. The mushroom had a grayish brain-like texture on the cap. This brain was punctuated by a number of pores that oozed a tar-like liquid. One might be disturbed by its appearance, but to me it was beautiful. The smell, however, was that of rancid flesh, making me gag as I approached it. I took my photos, over a hundred actually, wanting to capture it from all angles. I then attempted to take a spore print. To do this, I had to cut off the cap of the mushroom, which I feel bad about doing, but it is essential to the further research of the species. 
As I begin to cut the stem, the cap suddenly inflates, like a puffer fish, the black tar squirting on my gloves and shirt, and then, just as suddenly it deflates, leaving me choking on a cloud of dust-like spores. Despite a ruined shirt and a lung full of spores, I bag the cap of the mushroom and begin my ascent above ground, followed by a very long train journey home to Beijing. The symptoms came the next day, flu-like, headache, and loss of appetite. I also got my period two weeks earlier. I thought it could be coronavirus, but I'd taken mandatory tests when re-entering Beijing. Having tested negative, I can continue to work in the lab at my university. I took my spore prints and thoroughly documented my specimen using the standard methods. On the third day of my return, my boyfriend Tao really started to worry about me. I was not eating, I had no appetite, but my stomach was constantly rumbling. He made me stay home in our apartment and kept trying to feed me my favorite foods. He really is kind, but whenever I tried to eat something, it tasted so bad I felt like puking. On day four of not eating, Tao took me to the hospital. They ran all types of tests on me and asked me many exhausting questions. All I wanted to do was sleep. I felt very weak. They put me on an IV and kept me overnight. Tao stayed with me. I don't remember anything, but he told me as best as he could what happened. In the middle of the night, I suddenly stood up from my bed awakening Tao, who was asleep on a folding bed beside me. My eyes were open, but I was unresponsive like a sleepwalker. I slowly started to walk out of the, my room and down the corridor, my mouth slightly agape. Despite the late hour, there was still some activity in the emergency wing. Someone was being amputated in a nearby operating room. I was apparently captivated by this, and when a nurse packaged an amputated leg for a disposal, I followed. She brought it to a transfer facility to be made safe, a room where they prepare hazardous waste to be transferred and incinerated. Tao tried fruitlessly to wake me up and hold me back, but as the nurse left, I slipped into the empty transfer room and tore through the thick plastic waste bag with my nails. Tao described me as having inhuman strength, and nothing he tried would stop me. When I brushed him away, he was knocked down with incredible force. I consumed the entire leg, ripping the flesh from the bone like a rabid dog, the bones then crunching like cereal on my jaw. Thinking back on this, I am so ashamed. How could my body and subconscious commit such a savage act? Tao did not state this, but I knew his opinion of me was gravely tarnished. I am however so thankful for him as he stayed by my side and did not give up on me. He cleaned the blood from my face and hands that night. He found me new clothes and managed to get me back into my bed without alerting any of the staff to what I had done. I asked him why and he said, I didn't want them to take you away. When I woke the next day, I felt re-energized and was actually smiling. I was released despite Tao's insistence that they do more tests, but the doctors needed the beds for COVID patients and could find nothing wrong with me. When we got home, that's when Tao told me of my midnight episode. I did not believe him, but he showed me the blood under my nails, and I broke down crying and afraid. I tried to throw up in the toilet, but nothing came up. Tao was worried that if it happened again, he couldn't control me. I was too strong. We agreed that he would tie me to the bed tonight, just in case. I had been tied to the bed before, actually, and not against my will. Despite the bondage, my boyfriend was not attracted to me that night, and I cannot blame him. He was very quiet and kept his distance. I was worried that he would never see me the same way again. I wanted to prove him I was a normal person, but I had trouble believing it myself. What was happening to me? Tao spent the day on his PC playing his favorite game, Sword and Fairy a replica of a sword from the game on the wall above him. I'm glad that he's playing it now, keeping busy. I used to hate to see him play it so much when I was in need of attention, I admit. I sometimes fantasized that the sword above him would fall on his neck. When I fell asleep, I had nightmares of being trapped in the cave, the rancid brain-like mushrooms surrounding me, unleashing their splore clouds. Tao was not in bed when I woke up. I was still tied. When he saw that I was awake, he came up to untie me. Did I do it again? I asked. The look in his eyes said it all. I looked at my legs and wrists. They were scratched from where I struggled against my restraints. As Tao leaned over me to free my arm, I saw the mark on his ear. What happened to your ear, Tao? He did not answer at first. Tao, in the night, you bit me. I was devastated and afraid. Even though I did not know at the time 
what this would lead to. I didn't know if I was more scared of what was happening to me or more afraid of losing Tao. I'm sure he saw me for what I was now, a monster. To take my minds off things, I returned to the lab to continue my studies. It was the weekend and I was there alone. I was studying the spore print under the microscope. I isolated a single spore on a slide, and what I saw was unlike any spore I'd seen before. It resembled a virus rather than a spore, but on a much larger scale. On top of that, it was moving. I had to prepare three more samples to be sure. While examining the third slide, I coughed into my shock a dozen more spores appeared in the slide. I took a clean slide, spat and confirmed that my saliva was full of spores. Panic set in. When I'm anxious, I clean. It somehow makes me feel better. I thoroughly cleaned all the equipment with the strongest disinfectants in the lab. I packaged the mushroom cap and spore print in a dozen layers of specimen bags and labeled it all extremely hazardous before storing it in the ULT freezer. In the hall of my apartment building, I ran into my neighbor's child. When her parents are fighting, which is often, she plays with her dolls in the hall outside of their door. When she saw me, she fled back inside her apartment and locked the door. As I entered my own apartment, I looked in the mirror. I had dark circles in my eyes which themselves were dilated and bloodshot. My skin pale and my lips were a grayish purple. The feeling of not liking my own reflection is familiar to me. The feeling of being frightened by my own reflection was heartbreaking. Just by looking at Tao, I knew he was infected too. He started experiencing symptoms the next day. They were the same as mine, but at an accelerated pace. At this point, I attempted to notify the media to warn people of our sickness. No one I spoke to took us seriously, and all the posts I made online disappeared within hours. It was like screaming my warning into a void. I called my parents who lived in Shandong. I did not give them the full story, but they were still concerned and volunteered to come look after me. I told them I would get over it soon. I did not want to subject them to the illness and entering Shanghai as difficult during the current restrictions. Tao and I took turns sleeping that night, each of us watching over the other. Tao reported increased thrashing in my sleep. I even broke one of the restraints. My hunger was returning. During my turn watching over him, I was constantly chewing my own nails until there was almost nothing left. If this was nerves or hunger, I did not know. The next day we stayed in. I knew the mushroom was a source of our sickness, but Tao spent all his time online researching our symptoms. When he stood up, I thought he had found something, but he was unresponsive. He must have fallen asleep at his desk, he stood there for a long time, not moving, back turned to me. There was a voice in the hall outside. His attention snapped towards the door and he grabbed the handle, fumbling with the lock. I tried to stop him, but he brushed me aside and pulled the door open. The young girl was out there again. I could see her through his legs, sitting on the floor with her toys spread out around her in a circle. Tao grabbed her by the leg, lifting her with ease towards his drooling mouth. The girl screamed. I jumped on Tao's back my arms around his neck. He thrashed around to throw me off. His jaw snapped mechanically open and closed, inches from the girl's flesh. I swung all my weight against his neck, causing him to topple backwards through the open door of our apartment. We tumbled as a group, crashing into his PC desk. He dropped the girl as he fell. I yelled at her to run, but she just sat there, paralyzed with fear. I hit Tao on the head with a heavy ceramic plant pot. It did not faze him. He tossed me aside and I crashed into the wall next to his computer. He pounced on the girl like some great possessed ape. Tears streamed her face. There was no chance of her escape. And that's when I did it. I brought the sword down his neck. The replica sword had no sharpened edge, but the sheer weight of it against flesh was nearly enough to decapitate Tao. His broken spinal cord caused his body to fall limp on top of the girl. His head half attached. His mouth continued to snap open and close until I swung the second blow severing his head completely from his neck. I rolled his body away from the girl. She was unharmed, not even soiled. She ran off screaming and I closed the door behind her. And then I cried, alone and afraid. I cried for a long time, and I waited, thinking that soon the police would be here and my ordeal would be over. I was relieved in a sense. It would now be in their hands. If they locked me up, then I couldn't hurt anyone else. But no one came and I couldn't keep myself awake, so I locked the apartment door from the inside and threw the key out the window. The next day I woke to what looked like a burglary. 
My apartment was trashed. Broken glass, upturned furniture, and blood on the walls. It was no burglary, though. It was me. The apartment door had been savagely clawed at. It would probably not hold me for another night. My fingers were bloody and raw, but I felt no pain. I caught myself in the mirror to see I'd pulled out most of my hair. There was hair stuck between my teeth. I must have been eating it. And there in the middle of the floor lay my beloved towel. In a moment of fear and sadness, I tried to end it. I grabbed the shard of glass and caught myself. There was no pain in the little blood, as if the blood inside me had all dried up. Clinging to the large shard of glass with my bare hands, I plunged it into my own stomach. I coughed a bit of tar-like blood, but otherwise there was no real consequence. I was trapped in this monstrous body until I wasted away. Out of fear for myself and for the rest of humanity, I chained my neck with a bike lock to a sturdy radiator. I'm sure if I break free that the apartment door won't hold for long. I've since come to regret this decision. I'm not sure how many days it's been, but Tao's decaying body is now covered with small mushrooms. When they finally do find us, the infection will likely spread. I wish I had burned this place down, but instead I'm stuck here with my phone and my boyfriend's decaying corpse. Stay safe. I agreed to be in a zombie game show. There was a catch though. Day one. My name is Derek and my life is a train wreck. I have no job, no money, no family, and no opportunities. Which is probably what made me a perfect candidate for the game show. This isn't your typical game show, though. It's like Survivor on steroids. You need to survive seven days in a zombie apocalypse any way that you can. You can hide the entire time and hope to not starve to death, or you can become a zombie-killing god and murder your way through the apocalypse. The choice was completely yours. They were also offering a $1 million cash prize if you were to win. And in this case, it was all under the table. So that would be one million free and clear from Uncle Sam. This seemed like the perfect thing for me to get into. I hadn't been any use to anyone after getting out of the military. I had been an MP while I was in, and I definitely didn't want to be a cop when I got out. So after being approached about this opportunity, I asked what the catch was. At the time, they said there wasn't a catch. If you didn't survive the entire time, you would just go home without any kind of prize. But if you did win, you had the million to look forward to. At that point, I asked what I had to do, and they said they would send me a car to my location, and they would take me to this undisclosed location. I agreed and got ready for them to come pick me up. They were at my apartment within 30 minutes, and I was on my way to their facility. They said for my protection and theirs, they had to blindfold me, and also put headphones on me so I couldn't hear anything. The drive felt like it took roughly an hour, and I was ushered into what I assumed was the facility. I couldn't tell because I was still wearing the blindfold and headphones. When we finally did stop walking, the blindfold and headphones were taken off me, and I was face to face with an older man, probably in his 60s, who wore a plain black suit and had his hair slicked back to the side. He told me his name was Thomas, and that he would be the one conducting the trials. He asked me if I had any questions, and I wanted to make sure that there was really no possible way I could get hurt during any of this. He reassured me that the simulation was completely harmless and that there was nothing to worry about. I breathed a little easier and followed him to the staging area. We entered a room with a bed and what looked like a VR headset. They sat me down on the bed and explained that I needed to survive seven days in a zombie scenario. On the seventh day, I would have to face the horde. This was a massive swarm of zombies that I would need to deal with before the night ended. I needed to scavenge, craft, and build a solid shelter to fend off the horde. Each in-game day would be in one hour in real time, so I needed to move quick. As they laid me down, I was then strapped to the bed, which he assured me was just because the simulation is so immersive they are worried I'd roll out of the bed without realizing it. Just before he put the headset on me, he warned me that I needed to avoid being bitten or being killed. If I was killed in the game, there was no way they could pull me out. I was about to scream, but then the headset was put on, and everything melted away. Day 1. The next thing I knew, I was standing in a forest with nothing but underwear on and a few things in a toolbar on my HUD. I was immediately given a tutorial to familiarize myself with the game. I had to collect plant fibers so I could make a bedroll. I then had to gather supplies in order to make a stone axe. 
It then made me gather more plant fibers to make some pants, which sounded like a great idea. Once I created it, it had me put it on as well, which was done in a drop-down screen. I then had to gather some more wood so that I could craft a wooden club to defend myself. I had assumed that this was what the stone axe was for, but after using it, I believe it was more of a tool than a weapon. I then had to gather supplies to craft a bow and arrow, which would give me a range advantage against the zombies. It then showed me the absolute bare minimum of base building by having me gather wood to create a frame and then upgrading that frame. I then had to gather stones so I could craft a fireplace, which I assumed is how I would do all my cooking. I placed the campfire and was giving the following message. Good job, survivor. You have proven to be capable with much potential. We have marked your map with the nearest White River outpost location. There you will find a trader where you can buy and sell goods and trade stories with one of our friendly citizens. Welcome aboard, Noah. I wasn't sure who Noah was, but I figured it was probably a good idea to head towards the trader. He might hopefully be near a town where I could start looting for supplies. I followed the yellow explanation point, looting along the way. I came upon a house and decided I would loot it. That was when I saw my first zombie. It was missing both its legs and was stuck inside a hole in the wall. It crawled after me, but luckily, I had the club I crafted earlier, so I made short work of it. The game was extremely immersive, but I still remembered that it was in fact a game. These weren't actual zombies, so the shock wasn't too much to deal with. I couldn't believe how bad they smelled, though. It's never something you take into consideration when you think about zombies. I heard more zombies coming deeper in the house, so I retreated outside to make sure I didn't get surrounded. A large woman came out once I had dealt with this legless zombie, and she put up more of a fight. A young man was the next one I had to deal with, and we were able to handle him pretty easily with a few shots of the head. After all the zombies had been killed, I allocated a couple of my stat points to increase the effectiveness of my club to make handling the zombies easier. I then entered the basement again to finish looting the basement. Once the basement had been fully looted, I made my way up to the first floor. I smashed a picture on the way, and it's like the house came alive. I found a key in the wall and was able to unlock the nearest door to give myself an exit if I needed one. I dealt with a few zombies that were spread across the first floor. Once all the threats were neutralized on the first floor, I began looting the rest of the house. When I was in the kitchen, I noticed a ladder that went up to what I assumed was an attic. I climbed up the ladder, and as soon as I reached the top, I immediately woke up the few zombies that were sleeping up there. Luckily, there were only two, and one of them actually dropped some cowboy boots that I could use. There was one last one hiding in a corner, and I again was able to kill it pretty easily. It looks like when you finish raiding one of these buildings and clearing it out, there's a cache of loot at the end to reward the hard work. I looted the cache and started my small trek to the trader. I crafted a small storage box that I could use to drop the gear and food that I'd looted up to this point right outside the trader's house so I wouldn't get overloaded with items. This would cause me to walk slower and fatigue faster. I assumed it would probably make me burn through my food and water meter faster as well. Upon walking into the trader's compound, it looked like he specialized in farming and tools. His name is Trader Wrecked, and he just seemed like he just didn't want to be there at all. Upon inspecting his wares, I saw a helmet light mod that I thought could give me an advantage at night. I asked him if he had any jobs, and a list of five jobs popped up giving him the options between buried supplies, clear zombies, and fetch, all of which seemed pretty obvious what he wanted. I ended up going with clear zombies, because after the encounters I had with the zombies earlier, I figured it would be a cakewalk. Luckily it was only about 100 meters away, so I left the trader and worked my way over to the mission objective, killing zombies along the way. I made it to the house and started the mission for the trader. I walked around the house looking for a way to get in without attracting too much attention and found an open door leading to the basement. As soon as I entered the basement, I was met with two heavily burnt zombies that seemed like they were still slightly on fire. I smashed both of their heads in. The basement near the back is extremely dark, making me wish I would have had the money to buy the headlamp that I was looking at earlier. Once I cleared the first floor, I climbed up to the second floor and cleared all the rooms that I possibly could. The house had been ripped apart and you could see through almost the entire thing. I was able to find a ladder though that brought me to the upper portion of the house. This is when I found the loot room, but for some reason, the mission was not complete even though I was sure I had killed all the zombies. As I got closer to the loot though, a zombie fell through the ceiling and almost took a bite out of me. I scrambled back and prepared for a fight. I was able to drop this one in three hits this time. Apparently the few points I put into strength and pummel peed had paid off. 
Bat finished the mission I was on, and I collected the main loot. I then went made my way back to the trader again. I had a feeling I was going to be doing this a lot over the next seven days. When I returned to the trader, he offered me five different options for completing the mission. 500 cobblestone rocks, tempered blade mod schematic, serrated blade mod schematic, 750 coal, or 10 Molotov cocktails. I ended up choosing the 500 cobblestone rocks in hopes that it would help me with building the base I would need to fight the horde. I accepted my reward and immediately took the fetch job from him this time. This one was much farther away, about 400 meters this time. I wasted no time and made my way to the objective. It looked like the next place I would be clearing out was an old church. Not sure why he wanted this cleared out, but I didn't think too hard about it. I just needed all the money I could get from this guy so I could stay alive for the week. Looked like the only way in was through the graveyard. An undead vulture was able to scratch me before I could take it out, but I was lucky that I didn't just start bleeding. I climbed through the window into the church and started to clear it out. Books were thrown everywhere, and there were multiple zombies that I needed to deal with. I found a pair of nerdy glasses that would apparently increase the speed that I gained experience, which seemed like it made the trip even more worth it. After clearing this floor, I found a spiral staircase leading upstairs in a back room. There were multiple zombies on this floor as well, and luckily there was a torch so I could easily see them. This looked like the main area, so I collected the loot and made sure there wasn't anything else to find here. When I was satisfied that I'd found everything, I climbed down off the roof and made the journey back to the trader. I was offered five things again this time, and I ended up choosing 60 shotgun rounds this time. Hopefully at some point I'll find a shotgun to put them in. I also looked to see what kind of jobs he had and didn't want to do a buried supply mission, so I figured it was time to find somewhere to bed down for the night at. Before I left the trader though, I bought that helmet light and as much duct tape as I could afford. I then made my way over to a water tower that was close to the trader. I figured the elevated position could keep me safe at night, so I spent pretty much the rest of the day cutting down trees and collecting supplies to start building up some defenses for the tower. I also cleared up the zombie that was sleeping at the top. I managed to craft a small shelter for myself to spend the night in. I had overlooked the hatch that was on top of the tower and thought I should go in and clear out any zombies that might be in there. When I got down there, I was up against three zombies. Two of them started to run and caught me off guard. They ended up giving me exhaustion and dropped my health down to 66. I bandaged up and got out of that hellhole. I ended the night by having a few things to eat and bedding down for the night. Let's hope day two is just as successful as day one. I think I need a new security system. Written by 11 Velociraptors on r slash no sleep. My five pound Pomeranian, Killer Impulse, Kiki for short, certainly isn't mauling any home invaders for me, but she's always been a fantastic alarm system. I adopted her two years ago, and I can confidently say that she's one of the best things that's ever happened to me. I spoil her as best as I can on my librarian's salary, putting all of my spending money towards her, toward vets, toys, and dog food. In exchange, she hunts bugs and rats that make their way into our dingy apartment, she provides me with endless entertainment, and she acts as a free delivery notification system. Kiki's always been exceptionally wary of strangers. It's a trait that makes socializing her pretty much impossible. But most of the time, I see it as a blessing. She always lets me know when someone's at the door, which makes me feel safer, even though our apartment building is a pretty bad part of town. A few months ago, for example, a water pipe broke in between my and my neighbor's apartment and the resulting leak ate a hole in the wall before the pipe was fixed. For a few days, I had to move my bookcase into this entryway to cover up the 6 inch diameter hole, through which I could see right into my neighbor's apartment and vice versa. At least the hole was near the floor, and not at eye level, I guess. Maintenance took their sweet time responding to my request, and when they finally decided to show up, unannounced by the way, I was taking a nap on my couch, before the two men even had the chance to knock, Kiki started yapping her little Pomeranian heart out. In doing so, she gave me time to get up, quickly make myself decent, and put her in my bedroom before the maintenance workers let themselves inside. Last Tuesday, I came home after dark. The library was hosting their library card registration event, which always took place on the second Tuesday of the month, so I worked a longer day than usual. When I stepped into my apartment at around midnight, I almost tripped over a piece of wood in the entryway. You see, when maintenance fixed the wall, 
All they did was nail a plank over the hole, and it kept falling off no matter how many times I jammed it back into place. Rumbling to myself, I shoved the plank back into the wall and then took a seat on the floor, petting Killer and apologizing to her for my tardiness. She had a doggy litter box to do her business in and plenty of food, but I still felt bad about leaving her alone. I promised her an extra walk the following day. I also tried to give her a treat as an apology, but she didn't seem interested. In fact, she rarely seemed interested in her treats anymore and rarely finished her meals. I brought this up at her most recent checkup, but she hadn't lost any weight and seemed perfectly healthy, so I figured her metabolism was simply slowing as she got older. After taking off my shoes, I fixed myself some tea and sat on the couch to watch a little television. One of my favorite shows was on, so I made myself comfortable. Kiki joined me after a few minutes, hopping onto the couch and flopping dramatically onto the cushions. It was nice to be able to relax with my dog and have a hot drink after a long day of work. I almost drifted off to sleep before I heard that stupid piece of wood clattering on the floor again. Rolling my eyes, I ignored the sound. I would put it back in the morning. Half an hour passed, and I decided to get up. Usually on card registration days, I ended up falling asleep in front of the TV, so I thought I'd be responsible for once and brush my teeth before getting too cozy on the couch. Not bothering to turn the TV off, since I plan on coming right back, I rose from my seat with a stretch and made my way towards the bathroom. Once I was within view of the entryway, though, something gave me pause. The wooden board was still where I had pushed it under the wall. I looked at it for a moment, wondering what had made that clattering sound. It was a little odd, but I didn't give it much thought. The walls were thin in my building, and the sound could have come from something like a shampoo bottle falling in the neighbor's apartment. I walked into my bedroom to change into some sleepwear, smiling as I heard the little clicks of Kiki's paws against the floor as she followed me into the bedroom. As I traded my library outfit for a t-shirt and sweatpants, I got a strange feeling in my gut. Have you ever overdone it on your morning coffee and gotten anxious for no good reason? Like someone's triggering your fight or flight even though there's nothing apparently wrong? That's how I felt. I surveyed the dimly lit room, looking and listening for anything amiss. There seemed to be nothing out of place. I knelt down next to Killer Impulse, trusting her nose more than any of my own senses. To my relief, she seemed perfectly at ease. I gave her a few good scratches behind her ears and made my way back to the couch, Kiki still following me. I was fully awake at this point, though Kiki seemed alright. The nervous sensation stayed with me, making it impossible to relax. I kept thinking that I heard something, but when I turned the volume on the TV down to listen, I heard nothing at all. Every time I thought I heard something, I looked at Kiki, who was sleeping soundly on the couch next to me. Certainly, if something was strange going on, Kiki would have littered me by now. Right? I mean, she barked when our neighbors across the hall had people over, so surely if there was something going on in our own apartment, she would have noticed, right? An uneasy hour passed. I was too on edge to fall asleep, but I was also too tired to enjoy the show. I realized at almost 2 a.m. that I had forgotten to brush my teeth after I changed. Once again, I got up from the couch, my loyal companion also rising from a resting spot to stay by my side. I bent down to kiss her on the top of her fluffy head, and then we walked together towards the bathroom. Kiki got there a little before me, stopping by the closed door, and oddly, beginning to wag. As I watched her tail swish back and forth, I realized it wasn't just any wag either. It was the motion she made when she was getting a treat. Why was she making that motion in front of my empty bathroom? Kiki's always been exceptionally wary of strangers. She would never allow someone she didn't know to enter our apartment without letting me know. But what about someone she did know? What about someone who had somehow been giving her treats every time they saw her, getting her used to their scent, to their presence? I stared at the bathroom door, my heart feeling as though it was about to beat right on my chest. I had to get out of that apartment. Damn, I said dramatically faking an exasperated tone as the best I could. Left my wallet in my car again. I'll be right back, Kiki. I backed away from the door, keeping it in my sights until I'd made it out of the bedroom. Kiki followed me out, and once I had made my way to my, my apartment entryway, I grabbed my phone off the kitchen counter, scooped Kiki into my arms, and ran down the stairs to the lobby. Once I was there, I called the police to report a suspected intruder in my apartment. They found a man in my bathroom, 
He had been standing in my tub with the shower curtain pulled closed to obscure him. Although I had suspected a maintenance man or someone who else had worked in my building, I was surprised to see my reclusive neighbor being escorted to the cop car in handcuffs. As I watched him shamble his way towards the car, I noticed that his right hand was covered in scars. I assumed he'd been knocking loose the wooden plank between our apartments and reaching for the pet and feed Kiki. From the looks of it, she had been happy to bite his flesh to ribbons at first. But he must have earned her trust over time. He must have been plotting the break-in for at least a few months, slowly wearing down my trusted security system to ensure that she wouldn't alert me to his presence. I also suspect that he was paying careful attention to my routine. He had planned his break-in for a night when I always came home tired, and he had likely chosen his hiding spot because he had never heard me shower on the second Tuesday of the month. My neighbor wasn't the only thing the police found in my shower. He had brought with him a duffel bag filled with chloroform, soak rag, duct tape, rope, and the thing that haunts me most, a saw. Kiki and I have been staying with my parents for a few days while I get my nerves back under control. I don't blame her at all for what happened. She's still the best girl in the entire world in my eyes, but I don't think I can rely on her to be my personal arm anymore. I'm thinking about moving to a better part of the city. It might cost me an arm and a leg, but I think Kiki and I both deserve a place where we can feel safe at night, maybe somewhere with a built-in security system. Holy crap, I don't know if it's because I'm sitting in a dark room with the lights off, um, but that room, that like story really freaked me out. <laughs> um, stories about the paranormal are like freaky to me, but um, things that can happen in real life are way more freaky to me. Um, you, you ever get like the heebie-jeebies just walking around your own freaking house? Um, I got that reading that story, and that was just, it doesn't happen too often. You know, I read a couple of these stories every night, and um, the, yeah, these, this one got to me for, some, for whatever reason. So I appreciate you, 11 Velociraptors, for writing a, what I thought was a really good story, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. So I hope you have a good night, and uh, remember to always face your fears. Things are disappearing from my house, and I'm terrified by who might be taking them. Written by Relative Obscurity on r slash no sleep. The first time it happened, I didn't think much of it. I had left my house for work in the morning, just as I always did, and when I got home that night, my yucca plant was gone. The second time it happened, I honestly assumed it was my wife. Again, I had left my house for work in the morning, and when I got home that night, my umbrella was gone. But then I remembered that my wife had left the house earlier than me that day and got home after me, in addition to the fact that it wasn't even supposed to rain. The third time it happened, well, is when I started to get suspicious of the bizarre disappearances and began to wonder whether something else was going on inside my house. Yet again, I had left my house for work in the morning, and when I got home that night, lo and behold, my record player was gone. In all three instances, no matter where I looked for the lost items around the house, no matter how hard I tried to find them, they were nowhere to be found. This continued happening enough times that I eventually decided to keep a log to track everything that was disappearing. And so, I vowed that after a month of logging the missing possessions, I would scour the list for some sort of common denominator, some sort of motivation for why this was happening. But just a day before the end of the month, I left my house for work in the morning, and when I got home that night, the log itself was gone. That's when I realized that everything I wanted to keep, I had better take with me when I left my house for work in the morning, lest it be swept away by wherever all these missing things had swept away to. So that's exactly what I did creating an itemized list of only the things I couldn't live without by auditing every material object that I owned. And, in the process, I was incredibly surprised by both the amount of stuff that I'd accumulated over the years and the relatively small amount of stuff that I really needed. Once the list was complete, I would run through the same meticulous routine every morning, placing the most cherished of my personal belongings into a combination of my pockets and a backpack that I had brought for this very purpose. But one day, I left my house for work in the morning and forgot the backpack, and when I got home that night, it too was gone. After this had gone on for about two months, 
so many household items had disappeared that my wife had assumed that I had been decluttering the home, purging it of my unwanted things. This was, of course, not the case. But I was too afraid to tell her the truth, too afraid that she'd think it was all preposterous, so I just played along. However, I was so disappointed with myself for lying to my wife, and at the same time so frustrated with the disappearing items, that I swore to put an end to the situation, once and for all. So I ordered a surveillance camera, and as soon as it arrived, I installed it before leaving my house for work in the morning. But when I got home that night, sure enough, the camera was gone. That's when I realized that whoever or whatever was taking my things was aware that I was aware of it, and it was actively thwarting my attempts to thwart it. That only made me want to thwart it even more. The next week, I faked being sick, calling out from work each day for the sole purpose of coming up with a plan for how to stop the mysterious disappearances, or find out who or what was behind them, or both. That's when I had the realization that nothing seemed to be disappear when my wife left the house, and only when I did. Since I'd been married to her for eight years, and was fairly certain she wasn't the one hiding my things, I grew confident that there was someone or something else in the house who was specifically taking my things whenever I left. So I reached out to my company's HR contact, requesting to work remotely, and less than a month later, the request got approved, and I started working from home. Sure enough, a month went by, and nothing was stolen, which led me to wonder whether it had been actually my wife's doing, after all, rationalizing that even though she did tend to leave the house before me and get back after me every day, she could easily come back during her lunch break. It took me a week to gather the courage to confront her about it, and I finally accused my wife of eight years and trusted confidant of something completely outlandish, and just as I had feared, she thought it was all preposterous. And as to be expected, she could not have been more offended. We had the worst fight of our marriage that night, and both went to bed upset. And so, the next day, I decided to sacrifice a physical possession in order to make it up to Sarah, leaving my house for work in the morning with the sole purpose of buying her flowers. But when I got home that night, gift in hand, and ready to apologize this time, Sarah herself was gone. I should have known that she, too, had been taken away, but I was so obsessed with understanding the situation that I convinced myself that Stara, still angry at me from the night before, must have left. And with Sarah gone, I could finally know for sure whether she was the one behind everything. Once again, I left my house for work in the morning, and when I got home that night, the flowers that I bought for Sarah the day before were gone, and she had still not returned. But rather than accept the truth, I remembered that she still had the keys to the house, so the next day, I hired a locksmith to change every lock in the home before leaving my house for work in the morning. But when I got home that night, my coffee table was gone. And that's when I knew, for certain, that Sarah wasn't the one behind the strange disappearances. That's when I knew that she was actually the victim of them and that something else was undoubtedly in the house. My wife now missing, I cried myself to sleep hard that night, clenching at the very sheets that she once slept upon beside me. The next morning, I thought about calling the police, but I knew that the tale would sound so far-fetched that they'd never believe me. My sadness quickly turned to rage, and I proceeded to tear my home apart, searching under every bed, inside every closet, behind every curtain, and around every corner for any sign of the culprit, or the missing items, or both, leaving no stone unturned. But ultimately, I found nothing. That's when I remembered the basement, or lack thereof. The truth is, when we first bought the home, we were told that there was once a basement, but at some point over the years, one of its previous owners had sealed it off, leaving no trace of a stairwell downstairs. If I could just find such a staircase, or secret passage to the cellar, I just might be able to find the culprit, who I imagined would be sitting there, surrounded by a heaping pile of everything that had gone missing, including my wife. But no matter where I looked, I found nothing. Defeated, depressed, and terrified all at the same time, I strongly considered moving to an entirely new house, but ultimately, I couldn't bring myself to leave the place that I'd call home for the past eight years of marriage. Instead, my obsession with figuring out who or what had taken my wife 
and to wear consumed me and led me to drastic measures. And so, I started clearing out the house, selling off anything anyone would buy, and giving away anything left over, until my once cluttered home was reduced to an empty shell of its former self. When I finally got rid of the last item, I collapsed onto the regular floor of the now barren living room and sat there in silence, exhausted from what I've just done, but at the same time, satisfied with the fact that whoever or whatever had been stealing my things had nothing left to steal. That is, until I started to doubt myself, questioning every decision I had ever made, and thereby my very grasp on reality. I must have sat there in silence for 30 minutes, internally beating myself up about it, until I heard a rattling noise below me. Suddenly, in the middle of the empty living room, a trap door popped open, the very trap door to the basement that I had been previously looking for. Sitting on the floor, directly behind the now upright door and out of line of sight of whoever or whatever opened it, I suddenly saw a disfigured hand slowly reach out for something on the floor nearby. It was a pencil that I must have overlooked during the cleanse, the last object left to steal. Before I heard it speak, I'll be back tomorrow. Whatever it was, called out from behind the trapdoor. And like that, it took the pencil. I then heard it climb back into the basement and saw the trapdoor shut behind it, and as I still sat there on the floor, quietly cowering in fear. That was today. And tomorrow, my only hope is that it doesn't take me too. My name is Paul, and I don't know how else to get this information out without being sent to a padded cell. So I figured I'd come here and try to get my story out so that maybe your world won't make the same mistake as mine. Honestly, this place reminds me a lot of my home from when I was a kid. It hasn't been this nice in a long time, though. I couldn't remember the last time I had slept peacefully until coming to your world. I'm not sure how I got here, but I'm here now. And I'm glad I'm here. Part of me wonders if I died and this is somehow what heaven or hell looks like. That being said, I'm here now, and I never want to go back to that place. I am worried that this place could make a similar mistake, so hopefully, by getting this information out, we can avert that disaster. I'll start with what I do know. I'm a human, just like you, and I'm also from a place called Earth. It resembles this place almost exactly with maybe a few names changed here and there. But for the most part, this place feels pretty much like the place I remember as a kid. I remember growing up in a small town in northern New York. I went to school, played with my friends, and lived what I assumed was an average life. That was until I turned 18. On my 18th birthday, there was something big in the news that happened. There was some kind of terrorist attack. In this case, there wasn't an explosion but the release of some kind of chemical that killed everyone that was in a one mile radius almost instantly. I never did find out who had done the attack. I guess it doesn't matter now, but I still wish I would have found out. The attack took place in Times Square in New York City and was absolutely devastating. As you know, Times Square is an extremely popular tourist destination. I'm not sure how many people were there that were killed, but the cleanup of all the dead would have taken weeks if they have had a chance to do it. Before any humanitarian aid was able to be given, the dead started to rise. These weren't walkers either. They could do almost as much as a human could do when they got back up. There must have been 500,000 dead that got up all at the same time and devoured New York City in a matter of a few days. All I could do was watch in horror as the news pushed out broadcasts of the carnage 24-7. People in the city didn't have time to react. And before they realized that these people weren't really people anymore, it was too late. I did what any normal person would do during this time, and rushed to the supermarket to get as many supplies as my broke 18-year-old self could buy. As you would expect, the shopping center was almost wiped out immediately. People were tearing each other apart to get just one last can of soup or case of water. There were a lot of casualties the first few days, and the dead haven't even made it to us yet. 
We assumed the military would get this under control before it ever made its way six hours north of the city. The problem we didn't realize at the time was that this sickness, or whatever it was, could be spread. Anytime someone was bitten or scratched by one of those things, they would last maybe 12 to 24 hours and would die. Within an hour of death, they would get back up and start killing and consuming any living thing they could get their hands on. Our one saving grace was that animals didn't seem to be susceptible to the sickness. People were fleeing New York City and were heading to smaller rural areas to hide. Some of these people were sick, and within a few hours of making it up north, they had died and started spreading the sickness. That's how it was able to spread so quickly. That's why everything fell apart so fast. My first experience of one of those things was maybe a day or two after the chemical was released in New York City. I was held up in my house watching the news and trying to keep up with what was happening. Officials told us to shelter in place and limit the amount of time we were out of the house. They recommended we barricade doors and windows to avoid the infected. Before I had a chance to do any of this, one of them was slamming on my front door. It didn't take long for it to figure out that there was a window on my front porch and it smashed right through it. I only had seconds to get to my kitchen and grab the biggest knife I could find. It came staggering through the window, glass sticking to its skin. It didn't seem to even notice that it was bleeding and covered with glass. It was a man, maybe early thirties. It didn't notice me at first, but when it did, it came at me at a dead sprint. I tensed up and prepared for the impact. I swung the knife forward toward its head and was able to stab it directly in the eye. It slammed me to the ground and growled at me, trying to bite me in the neck. With my hand still on the handle of the knife, I pushed with all my might and felt the knife sink deeper into its skull. The man went limp, and I pushed him off, trying to pull myself together. I didn't have much more time to pull myself together before I realized more of them were outside. I ran upstairs, grabbed my rifle, and prepared a go bag. There was no way I was going to make it staying in this house. It was too easy for them to get inside. I grabbed the knife from the man on the floor and grabbed my keys. I didn't know where I was going to go, so I just started driving and hoped that I would find what I needed. We had a nearby military base, but I didn't think that would be a great idea for me to go with how many people would be heading that way, healthy or infected. I headed east toward the Adirondacks with the hope that it wouldn't be as populated. I never did manage to make it that far. My car ended up breaking down halfway there after I accidentally hit one of them. I ended up in a small town that I could tell had already been ravaged by them. I didn't see any of them around, so I went to the closest house that looked the easiest to fortify. That's actually where I ended up spending the next 15 years in. I saw my fair share of them from time to time as the years went by. I saw even more any time I had to go to the neighboring towns to find supplies. Luckily they didn't seem interested in anything other than humans, so I was able to hunt and fish to feed myself. I built a decent sized garden that gave me fresh veggies. I was very lucky. I had seen on the news, while they were still airing it, that many places were teeming with these things. They were everywhere, and no one seemed safe. After about four days I stopped seeing the news. I'm not sure if this became a global problem, but I never saw aid come from other countries. So they either left us here to our own devices, or the infection had spread outside the borders and the whole world had gone to hell. You may be asking yourself, how did I get here then? I've been trying to figure that out myself. I don't know if this is an alternate dimension, or I just died and have no memory of it. Either way, I'm happy. I'm here, and I have no want or need to go back to that place. Please be safe out there. <laughs>